but I will give a brief rattle through where we are, what we do, uh, and some of the things that we 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 do that would be considered agroecological. Um, and then, if anyone has any questions about quite how bonkers I think my farming system is, um, please please ask. Um, so yeah, as Will said, we are based just outside um, Sirencester, up on top of the Cotswolds. So we run across um, a fair amount of limestone brash hills, but we run down into the Thames Valley. So we do have some very heavy clay and some very light sandy gravels that we have to manage, which gives us a good variation in, in soil type to play with. We are predominantly conventional, but we also have an organic farm in the system as well, which means I get to look at uh, the agroecology side of life from, uh, from a conventional point of view, where we still have the use of chemicals and we still do use artificial inputs, um, and then look at it in, in a completely different spectrum or slightly different spectrum of the fully organic where um, obviously I have no access to that. We are a mixed farm, we always have been. Um, we've always relied very heavily on livestock as part of our part of our system. Um, we have uh, a pig finishing unit, we've got a pedigree herd of beef cattle, um, a big flock of sheep as well as the um, as well as the arable and there is some some veg in the system as well which um, is is not not that conventional. Um, on that side of life. Um, with the arable side, as Will mentioned, um, we grow part of our part of our system and part of working our system is growing a large range of, of crops and not relying on a short, sharp rotation. So um, we grow uh, milling wheat, biscuit wheat, feed wheat, um, malting barley, oilseed rape, beans, peas, maize, combinable rye, milling oats, spelt, triticale. Um, uh, we also grow seed crops of phacelia um, and buckwheat. We have turnips, garlic, um, herb and legume rich grass lays and um, a whole variety of cover crops that all play a part uh, in the system in, in one way or another. Um, each brings their own challenge and each brings their own, um, their own benefit to our system. And encompassing all of that and across all the land that we farm, um, we have a very large mid-tier scheme, um, which has the benefit of A, making us um, slightly less reliant on, on the sellable produce, um, but also helps some of the underlying agroecological principles of having nature um, and having biodiversity uh, within the farming system. That is, that is a key part of what I found that helps our system to work um, how it does. Um, and part of our, our mid-tier scheme is also a lot of water meadow regeneration land that we currently have um, is currently standing very deep in water um, but as part of a space for water scheme we now take a whole load of water back onto what once was arable land um, on some thin gravelly soils that predominantly historically probably would have been a crop of winter wheat by now that with water standing on it or rushing over it would have been ditching nutrients and silt into a river it is now, um, it's now the most amazing wading bird site. Um, we have uh, the biggest numbers of black wings I've ever seen um, standing out there uh, and we get some great grazing out of it in the summer. So part of the um, sort of agroecological principles that we, we use on the farm, um, uh, so obviously a big one of them is recycling nutrients. So uh, we, from our livestock side of life, we produce a lot of FYM and an awful lot of slurry. We top dress as much of our um, combinable crops with slurry um, as we can, which has meant that we have sort of a between 45 and 50 percent reduction in use of artificial N as a whole. Um, and then also part of recycling nutrients that with all of our grass lays being herb and legume rich mixes that we are fixing nitrogen through the use of legumes. So we're not having to rely on on bought in inputs to grow our grass that feeds the cattle and the sheep. And we also um, graze a lot of our arable crops. Um, it's not uh, that um, sort of well, well practiced at the moment, but historically it was basically your only disease control um, back in my grandfather's day. And part of that grazing as well as um, removing disease um, also allows us to recycle nutrients that may not be recycled as quickly by waiting for leaf matter, let's say the bottom of an oilseed rape canopy for leaf matter to break down um, and to release those nutrients. We put the sheep over it to knock it back and recycle that nutrient, those nutrients far quicker through the system. Um, 
another part of the sort of agroecological principles um, is is the whole reducing of inputs, which, like I've mentioned before, we we use with with slurry. Um, and by using the grazing, so for instance, uh, just this morning we've been moving sheep off some triticale and pushing them back onto some wheat. We by removing all the green growth that we currently have that's been there since October, November, since emergence, we have removed any latent infection um, on, on, on old leaves that drive nothing for yield whatsoever. So all they have actually become is a is a slight nursery for, for disease. By removing them with the sheep, um, we now get to a stage where we are massively reducing fungicide inputs because we don't have um, we don't have the latent infection to start the season with that we're always fighting. We start basically in the next two weeks when they start to re-emerge at a perfectly sort of fresh, clean, um, clean slate. Um, as well as as well as grazing, um, we also now have removed basically all herbicides from our farming system. Um, so now we rely on either companion cropping to smother things out of the way that I don't want. For instance, with our oilseed rape, um, we use a combination of clovers and buckwheat um, to basically smother anything out that, that, that shouldn't be there. Um, and on the sort of more, more sort of cereal side of life, um, we are now into row hoeing with camera guided, um, camera guided hose. So using technology to, to help us on that front um, and, and having removed, uh, allowing us to remove the need for, for applying herbicides anymore. Um, and then tying all this together um, is the biodiversity and the soil health side of life. So the, the underlying part of all this is that if my soil isn't functioning properly and isn't working properly, all of these ideas are great. But actually, if the soil isn't giving anything to a plant, I can't really achieve very much with it. So part of our soil health has been along the lines of removing a lot of tillage. We still do. We are very flexible in what we do. We still do have a plow um, and, and, and we still do cultivate things. It's not all about direct drilling, but that is a, a big part of it for, for, for keeping carbon in the soil to feed soil microbes. Um, and, um, and the biodiversity side of it with, with our mid-tier scheme, with margins, with infill beetle banks, creating much bigger habitat spaces through through blocks of land, um, the use of companion cropping with things like oilseed rape, getting predators into the middle of a field rather than relying on, we haven't used insecticide on, on any of our crops. I think now this is our ninth year of, of having not had to use insecticide and we still are yet to lose a crop of oilseed rape to flea beetle. And I'm still yet to find any BYDV in a, in a cereal crop because we have the natural predators now that keep aphids and, and flea beetles under control. Um, and yeah, part of the, the sort of tying in with the soil health and animal health, as, as Lucy mentioned, is our use of multi-species herb and legume rich lays. So we've been able to reduce our use of wormers through the livestock by using herbal lays, by grazing, rotationally grazing cereals. So we don't have a worm burden in the soil already because they're only grazed once a year. And also by actually um, now we're doing a lot of um, trial work with worming lambs, uh, worm, worming ewes across chicory. Um, instead of having to use uh, sort of an artificial, uh, an artificial wormer. Um, so part of what Will's asked me to talk about is, is, is how we got started. And I think some of that has already, I've already covered, but so sort of being a mixed farm, um, it, we are sort of part of the way there already in our, in our system. It, it's formed the basis for, for what we do. Um, and like I said, now with, with direct drilling, with the use of cover crops over winter or over summer, um, especially if we have a weed problem, instead of cropping it now and having to fight it, actually we'll put a cover crop in, we'll graze it, we'll remove seed return from the system, um, and, then, and then moving that on to then companion cropping. So uh, rather than just not cropping it now, we now companion crop things. So for instance, um, like I said, at Orseed Rape, we, we grow with clover, we grow wheat with clover at the moment, um, we grow phacelia with, with beans um, to help give some extra, extra pollen. Um, that was sort of the, the starting point. We then moved on to removing all seed dressings out of our system. So we don't put any, any uh, fungicidal seed dressings on anything that goes in the ground anymore because I want my I want the seeds that I'm putting in the ground to engage with the fungi that are there, having spent a lot of time and effort building soil carbon and building soil health and, and getting the, the, 
the soil working to then coat a seed in a fungicide and shove it into what is effectively a perfectly primed system and then ask it to to basically kill everything it needs to interact with um has always has, has struck me as a little little um strange occasionally so instead of fungicidal seed dressings we now use basically a cocktail of um trace elements and that um as lucy covered uh, is all designed around constant soil sampling tissue sampling and grain sampling so where where we're planting i know what our our, our soil scores are um i know what our soils struggle to hold on to being predominantly limestone we we struggle to hold a lot of elements in place and then throughout tissue historical tissue sampling we we know vaguely how how things play out through the growing season and so we can prep for it and so we will we mix a cocktail of trace elements that prime specific plants and or specific seeds in specific places to to engage best with the soil biology so they do change between limestone and gravel um, and clay because they have different different aspects that affect it but but um like lucy said a lot of what it is is um is is down to testing and recording to then bring the system forward um We've always used our slurries. Um, we're now getting better at using them. And again, as Lucy mentioned, it is down to, to testing and, and use of that slurry. It's not a waste. I don't see our slurries as a waste product that we need to sort of manage and get rid of. Um, they are a, a key part of, of, of what we do and how we grow stuff. And so we are um, we, we sample them before we spread. We sample whilst we're spreading. We then do tissue and soil samples two weeks and, and four weeks after spreading to make sure that what we thought we were putting on, we've actually gained. And, and how efficient that has been. So um, that's sort of the way the way through which we sort of started. So starting from, from always being a mixed farm to, to direct drilling cover crops to now seed dressings out and then on to yeah, onto removal of fungicides and herbicides to a to a system where where basically we are we are now far less reliant on external um, external inputs than we than we ever were before. Um, it's not all plain sailing um, as much as I'd like to think it was. There are and have been and still are ongoing challenges um, as part of our system. Um, I've mentioned before things like BYDV and flea beetle are two big issues that that, that affect basically every arable grower out there, um, unless you're lucky enough to live in a part of the world where aphids don't appear um, at, at when, when you don't want them to. Um, and, and BYDV is, is a constant threat in our system with having, having no use of insecticides through my own choice. Um, so as I pointed out, using nature and using biodiversity to make sure that actually um, we have the predator numbers available to start attacking aphids as soon as they start to move in means that we are yet to have a complete crop failure through BYDV. We've had patches on the top of a hill where some aphids have blown in and you can see where they spread in the spring, but actually you then go and look at it um, on a sort of a warm day in November, uh, early in the morning, and you can't see the ground for spider webs. Um, and spiders are pretty good at trapping them and disposing of them. The Another challenge has been our reduction of inputs has been high on the agenda of what we've tried to achieve, but it does come with its with its issues. Um, removing fungicide is, is, is great uh, in theory, if only I could model the weather slightly better than it actually happens, um, that we can plan that we can get a crop to a certain stage and with very limited fungicide input, we might be able to get through the system. And sometimes come mid-June, a wet week is it can make or break a crop. And we have in the past had crops where we basically lost the flag leaf to either yellow rust or septoria, which is always a bit of a, a knock, but that seems to happen very rarely because we are choosing varieties based upon disease resistance. I, I never look at yield when I choose a variety. I, I look at its yield resistance and its and its its end market, which fits us. Um, the other, another challenge that we have faced is again the removal of herbicides. It is it is great from a soil health point of view and from a gross margin point of view, but again it does come with its with its issues. Um, you know, uh, the just going cold turkey. Um, failed for us on a block that we tried it on. We just removed one year, all herbicide inputs, full stop. Actually, what we should have done is wound our way down through it. So um, we still need to use occasionally Roundup pre-drilling, but to mitigate some of the bad, some of the antimicrobial effects that, that Roundup can have, 
Uh, we're now mixing it with um, short chain carbons in the form of fulvic or humic acid to help mitigate some of the effects that, that these chemicals can have on soil biology. Um, so it's not it's not about totally removing everything from the system. It is more about um, choosing choosing when and where to apply something and working out uh, the pros and cons of doing it um, prior to, to application and working out if there is a way of mitigating some of the some of the effects. Um, for instance, we did a lot of work with the hydrology and um, the hydrology uh, and ecology society and looked at fungicide usage and how certain fungicides can have a detrimental effect on soil fungi and how some others actually can benefit and so therefore that is always a, a, a start point for me if we have to use fungicides is looking at the the effects on soil health rather than the effect on the disease that I'm 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 trying to manage um, and another challenge has has been I've had to learn to live with a lot more disease in crops, but we found a way of now managing it to a level where it doesn't impact our yields too much. Um, I've had to learn to live with the fact that some of my crops don't look very tidy where we grow them with companion crops or we're grazing them, you know, just this morning having moved sheep off a, off a field of field of triticale. My neighbor's winter barley is looking lush and green and mine is currently looking a bit brown because we've removed all the green area. But that is that is a, a personal challenge that I have to deal with uh, every now and then. Um, so some of the key sort of um, approaches I think that I've found that have that have helped us go through this system um, has been um, some of it's based around education. So things like this, listening and talking to other people out there, have been some of the biggest helps, um, uh, biggest help that I that I could have found. Um, another one is is learning that sometimes less is actually more. That we're on some yield limited soils up here. We're, we're never going to produce ten tons per hectare of wheat. It's basically physically impossible on our on our ground. And actually, producing a far lower yielding crop that is far more sustainable, um, environmentally friendly, and and actually comes out with a better gross margin puts me in a more more uh, puts me in a much safer place moving forward. And um, having a lot of flexibility has been the other part of it in the fact that my my rotations never fix um we change them quite literally on a weekly basis depending on looking at, at, at what what soils look like now at this time of year looking just for instance, looking at spring cropping looking at what condition soils are in we've actually changed where we might put some spring wheat that we actually now are going to put a cover crop um, just because I'm not happy with the soil structure and, and, and forcing a bad crop into the system that is actually not going to make me anything um, is not really a sustainable way forward. Um, and a lot of testing and benchmarking. So constantly comparing what we're looking at now as to what we have done in the past and benchmarking that against other more traditional conventional farms to see actually how we are performing. Um, because sometimes we don't perform as well. And that is something that either I need to look at and try and address or actually sometimes maybe accept that there are certain scenarios where I won't be able to out yield um, a more sort of conventional system. Um, so uh, some of the results that we've seen over the past, I mean, we've been seriously at it for five years, but over the past sort of 10 years or so of, of having a slightly lower input system, um, we've had a huge increase in biodiversity. So that's with habitat creation, with the use of our water meadows, with yeah, integrating livestock into the system, we now have far more wildlife and biodiversity, A in our soils and B moving around the moving around the farm. Um, we've seen a large increase in um, carbon capturing ability of our soils. So we have far more active carbon in there working away. Um, and so therefore the more organic matter we can add, the more carbon we can fix. Um, so that has been a been a fairly a fairly big result. And we've actually we now actually produce more of an output in this in the way of uh, saleable commodities than um, than we used to because we've got such a large range of things that can all fit into the system in their own their own little part that we have actually been able to up our output strangely whilst being far less intensive and actually farming less ground um, as, as a percentage of the whole. Um, and so, so looking at, at yields, um, which is always quite an interesting one, um, we never had a sharp drop 
because our system we 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 went into it slowly we didn't start on like so we didn't start on day one and go right that's it i know i'm going to change our system in in one go as we sort of crept into it slowly over the years we we have seen a a we did see a, a sort of a gentle decline um whilst the system sort of kicked in and whilst you know whilst whilst issues wrinkles are being worked out um so i mean in in a in a high yielding wheat wheat year in in our area we might yield somewhere between 10 and 15 percent less than our neighbors um on identical soil types on in an average year we tend to sit plus or minus five percent either side of, of actually where we where we used to be um and actually ironically in very bad years our system seems to yield slightly better um for instance last year we we yielded um in our hdg benchmarking group we we managed to actually yield better than some of our neighbors um in a, in, in a in a very sort of drought stressed well after a wet autumn and a drought stressed summer um it does differ with with different crops wheat is fairly um sort of ambivalent about life it doesn't seem to mind our system barley and rape yields have actually increased um by the use of this system um and oats beans and maize they do struggle with it a bit occasionally but there are still things to sort of to sort of work out through that um, so we have found that we we have better resilience to um, extremes of weather, um, and it allows us to sort of our, our, our broad range sort of um, spectrum of of things on the farm allow us to be we are now more risk averse in 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 one respect because we have so many different aspects to look at when if if one fails or one doesn't do very well there is something else that can either pick up the slack. Um, or you know, if we have a crop of wheat that is is so full of something that I can't get rid of, uh, you know, wild oats, for instance, I have the option of whole cropping it and putting in a silage plant to feed a cow, um, which means it's not a total loss; it's a readjustment of a loss and a readjustment of an end use. But it still has a place in our system, and those nutrients will still come back in the form of FYM back to where it came from. Um, so that is sort of a brief ramble through the basis of what we do. Um, I hope that was was useful.